Thursday, I think Thursday morning, uh, we're doing the Daniel's fast. Uh, we, we off Thursday morning. We want to um, continue to move forward. I don't know about y'all, it's been very, very refreshing to fast and seek God, amen? And you know, when you fast, you get God's attention. I don't know if y'all know that. You, you get God's attention because what you're saying is, I'm denying myself. I'm going to deny myself for God, and we do it every year. And since we've been doing it and then praying every week, we see the hand of God move. Amen? We see the hand of God move, but we got to stay right there because God is honored when we're honoring him. Is that all right? Amen, amen, amen. We did a, a series on salvation. Um, we're still on it, but we did a series also. We did a sermon on um, security, knowing that you have a safety net under you. Amen? We did a series, we did a little sermon on that, but we're going to come back this week, and we're going to talk about this, because this is very important. If you have blown it, there's always room to come back. I don't know about y'all. How many of y'all blow it sometimes? All right, I see every hand up in here. Sometimes we blow it. Sometimes we don't do what God called us to do. But, you know, I thank God. Listen, I serve God more because he's graceful. He shows me grace. He shows you grace, and because of that, I want to serve him. I want to, I want to do what's right, amen? We, we know we think we got a God that's dropping hammers all the time, you know, just beating you up. God ain't always like that. God, don't get me wrong now. There's another side of God you don't, you don't want to see. But in our relationships, he wants to grace us. We are in Christ Jesus now. We are under a different dispensation. We weren't not under the, we're not under the dispensation of law. We're under the dispensation of grace. Amen, amen, amen. My son called me up. My adopted son called me. He said, Dad, he said, he texted me. He said, Dad, I want to let you know, you know, I love you. And you're my friend. He said, I thank you for being my dad. He says, I thank you. When he said this, this is what got me. I thank you for choosing me. And you know where I went with it. I thank you for choosing me, and I thought about something. I mean, it brought tears to my eyes, but I thought about something. It took him 24 years to understand that he was chosen. It took him 24 years to understand that he was chosen. I don't even know if y'all understand we've been chosen. We are chosen people, a royal priesthood. Huh? That's what the Bible says, we're chosen. God chose me and you, and I, got, I had to tell you this. Because it, I was elated that he just said that to me. Dad, I'm so glad that you invited me into the family. I am now a part of your family. I'm a Lucas. Man, that did my heart some good, man. Because I love him. I love him. I love my, I love my son, man. I want to see him, you know, walk for the Lord. But I love him, man. You know, he's been in my life since he was one. And now he's 24, 24 years old. You know, that, so to see. Um, him say that means a lot to me. And we're, and, we're, and we're tight. We're actually tight, me and him. Pretty tight. We get on the phone and chop it up. You know what I mean? But I want to talk about today if you have blown it. Anybody ever blew it? You can always come back. Huh? There's always room. God always has a place for you. Is that all right? Sometimes we, you know, we, we um, hear people, they think they, they blew it. That's it. I can't bounce back. That's not so. Amen. I want to talk about David. We talked about it a little bit a few weeks ago, but David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man that God entrusted to the kingship. He was a man that God had actually given him the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He had an anointing on his life to do ministry and to be a king. Amen? And understand this, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't indwell man like it does now. But the Holy Spirit came upon a man for a specific task. Y'all with me? And so we see that David had the Holy Spirit upon him for a specific task. But then David found himself in a mess. David found himself peeking off the top of the roof. And then I, I gave her some thought, though. He was looking at Bathsheba. But I had to give her some thought. Bathsheba knew he was looking. Huh? You know when somebody looking at you, y'all went, oh, this joker looking at me. You know what I'm saying? She knew too, but, but we don't want to blame Bathsheba. We want to blame him. Am I right? He looked and he looked and he looked and he longed and he looked and he looked. 
Finally, he went and said, told my servant, go down and get this girl. Now, understand now, Uriah was his, was his ace coon boon. Uriah was his man. Uriah was that guy that was his right hand, ride or die. Uriah was that guy that you put on the front line, he'd get it done. That's what kind of guy he was. Faithful, loyal. Well, this was Uriah's wife he was looking at. So he took, he took Bathsheba. She must have been bad, Bathsheba. You know. <laughs> he took bad Sheba, right? He took bad Sheba, and he took, when he took bad Sheba, he took and went into bad Sheba, right? Bathsheba, they must have been out there fighting for a while. This is when men ought to be out to war. David should have been out fighting too. Well, he took Bathsheba, and then she found out she was pregnant. So there was some time lapse. That was a lot of time there. You find out you're pregnant, it takes what, a good what? Eight weeks, close to eight weeks to find out you're pregnant. She could have been more than that. But now he wanted to cover his sin. Anybody ever try to cover your sin? You done did some stuff, now you're trying to cover it up. Well, he tried to cover it up. He says, tell Uriah, come on home. I need him to come on home. Tell Uriah, take a break. He's been working hard. Uriah, I need you to go home and enjoy your family. Well, Uriah came back. Uriah sat on the front step of his house and refused to go in because he knew that he had men out here that was fighting for him. He wasn't like David. He was faithful. He was loyal. And he came back, and David says, What's up with Uriah? Why don't he go in the house? He wants to be faithful to his guys. He can't see enjoying the comforts while his guys are fighting. He says, go ahead back out to war, Uriah. Here, David now is plotting. He's plotting, how can I get this man because I got to cover my sin up. I got to cover it up because what he wanted to do was blame him for the pregnancy. That's biblical. It's in the Bible. Something happening for Nehon. Well, Get him on the front line. And when you get him on the front line, do me a favor. When the, when the heat, when, when the battle is in heat, when the battle's real high, back up and leave him. He wanted him to die. So he allowed him. He died. Watch this. He died. David thought he got away with it. Any other time you, you do something, you think you got away with it? <laughs> he comes back. He's doing everything normal. All of a sudden, the prophet, Nathan, went to him. He said, David, hey, what's up, man? What's going on? He said, man, that was a man that had two lambs. I mean, he had, the man had one lamb. One guy had a fleet of yams, a bunch of, a bunch of uh, lambs. He says, he says, you, you know what, you, what happened? The one that had, he said, he said, they come to feed the king. I should take you to the story. But he says, what happened was this. Watch this. He took the man that had one lamb. He had a bunch of lambs to feed somebody else, to feed this king or whoever it was that was coming. And David, listen to the story. He said he took his one ewe lamb, and he had a lot of lambs. Well, this was a lamb that he loved, he cherished, he held, he loved this lamb. He said he took his one lamb. And David said, where is it? He says, I will have his head. And he looked and says, you are the man, David. See, sometimes we got to see ourselves. Sometimes God will bring you to see yourself. I'm not talking about yourself, but I'm talking about your real self. See, we think we're here, but we're really here. From the pulpit to the door. We think we're up here, but we're really here. If you take the scale off of all this stuff, you would see a whole lot of stuff. Am I We have not arrived. That's why Paul says, I fight daily, strive daily for perfection, never to obtain it on this side because I'm dragging around that old flesh. I can't, I can't do this on this side, but I have the power of the Holy Spirit if I yield to him. But the problem is we're not yielding. Am I right? <laughs> it was only after David's sin was made public that David chose to repent. It was during the time of repentance and soul searching that David penned the Psalm 51. Amen? In the verse, in these verses, he expresses the heartfelt need of 
of a believer to be right with God. So, so this was not just for David, it's for us. It's for our ammunition. This Psalm 51 is when you find yourself at the low, you find yourself in a place, and you know you need to repent. That's what this psalm's for. To lift you up, to let you know that God is still there. But David had to do one thing, he had to repent. He had to come clean. See, God don't want you just to say, I'm sorry. He wants you to have a heartfelt sorrow. He wants you to come with a heart of repentance. Am I right? Read verse 1, verse 1, 51, 1 real quick. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. So he knew, he knew, I'm in a mess. I'm in a mess, and I need God to get me out of this mess. I'm really up to my neck. I can't do anything else. Anybody ever been there? And it brings you to tears because you know you blew it. You know you blew it. You know, and some of us think that we can't bounce back. But God is always room to bounce back with God, isn't it? I got a, um, I'm a I got a, uh, what is it? My mother-in-law bought me a punching bag. I said, I want a punching bag. So I got a little gym in the basement. So I got a punching bag. I put water in it. It's pretty, pretty big. So I'm down there hitting this bag. And every time I hit this bag, guess this bag kept doing? Coming back. Kept bouncing back. I don't care if I kick it, smack it, slap it. It don't matter. Punch it. The bag kept coming back. So what I'm saying to you, no matter what you went through in life or what you're going through in life, there's always room for a comeback. Am I right? God always has room to bring you back. He's always there with an extended arm. Amen? So if you're saved, the devil knows that he cannot have your soul. But he does seek to get you down, discouraged, defeated. He delights in leading Christians into a backslidden condition and then convincing them that they will never be able to get back again to, with God. You ever been down on yourself? I mean, really, I mean, you down, you done did something, you ain't, and you like, oh. And you feel naked. You feel like Adam felt. Where are you, Adam? He felt like Adam. Where are you, Adam? Because Adam felt so dirty and felt so naked. Amen? Because sin will always make you feel naked. But we thank God that the devil's a liar. Amen? He's a liar. I know I'm speaking to somebody today. Amen? Somebody. Satan tempts us to sin. He says, you can get away with it. You, you believe the lie. Come on, you can, you can do this. Come on, you, you know you're all right. And now he leaves you once you do it. And then he, I always say this, he takes you there and then he leaves you. Amen? He took Adam and Eve there, then he left them. See it? He took you to that place when you fell short and then he left you. It's okay to do it. God, you'll be all right. That's what he does. Deceitfulness. If you have it, watch this. If you have, it would be safe to say that you are a backslider. Now Satan tells you that you have thrown it all away and can never get back what you have lost. He's a liar. He's a liar. Amen? The Bible teaches us that we can come back when we have blown it, but, but, but let's, look at the t let's look at it today. I trust that you will be able to get back up today. Allow me to share with you how to get back up today. As you look at David's story, you see how David came back, but David had to own it. You heard somebody say, be true to, true to yourself? He had to be true to himself and true to God. Amen? If you're not true to yourself and you don't see your mess, you ain't no comeback. See, God will say you're still saved, but, but you're going to break fellowship. And you won't, be able to be, you won't be able to function. We got habits we're doing. We got some of us got stuff we're doing up in here, and we practicing that stuff. And God knows it. God sees it. Not that he don't love you, but he wants to use you. He wants to be a, you to be effective, and you can't be effective holding on to stuff. Am I? Mm. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We pray that you would bless us as we go into your word. We pray, Lord, that we get something, that we glean something from your word that we're able to take with us, that we're able to better ourselves and better our lives, and that we might see you high and lifted up. Now sanctify me in your word. Your word alone is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So the first one I want to look at, I want to look at the capacity for sin in the 
believer, in the saint, the capacity that we still as believers have the capacity to sin. I want you to know that. That as long as we drag around this old man, we still have the capacity to sin. See it? And I don't know if y'all know it, this thing has a whole lot of habits. That's the old life. It has a whole lot of habits, and you're dragging it around because you're not going to get rid of this until you drop the robe of flesh. It's got to drop first, and then it's got to be changed. You've got to get a new body. Am I right? But you're dragging it around, and you've got a whole lot of habits. Habits you had since you was a kid, and you're still struggling. Everybody's like, mm-hmm, Pastor's in my, oh, my God. <laughs> So the capacity to sin, I want you to get that piece. That we as, as Christians have the capacity to sin, right? Salvation saves the sinner but does not take away his ability to sin. You have power over it, but it doesn't take the ability away. Am I right? Am I making any sense? It doesn't say, and that's why you see people struggle. That's why you see people hit and miss. That's why you see what you see. Because you see the struggle. And it's a struggle with the flesh. It's a struggle with the flesh. And that flesh is so ugly. That flesh begs you. I don't know if y'all know this. You've been on this fast? That flesh is begging. Am I, oh, oh, give me a burger. Oh, I want a fry. No, take these vegetables. Oh, no. <laughs> Am I right? Look at, look at Romans 6.14. Watch this. I want y'all see this. Y'all know I'm, I'm telling the truth. That's why you're laughing. You know I'm telling the truth. Man, I, I went in a uh, place, man, look at that food. I said, man, I told my wife, I said, let's get a burger. I said, we won't tell the church. She said, but God, I know. I, I wasn't serious, though. She said, God, I know. I said, God, dang it. I said, God, I forgot. God, I he on everything, man. 614, what you got, Romans 614? For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. So wait a minute, it says sin don't what? Have no dominion. It has no dominion. What's that word dominion mean? Power. Dominance. That's what it really means. Dominance. Still power, but dynamite. D dominance. See, before I was dominated by my flesh. See, I don't know if you know. And then when I did, I didn't care. I saw what? Still had a conscience, but not a God conscience. There's a difference between a conscience, God-given, God gave that too, but there's a God-given conscience, a divine conscience. The Holy Spirit indwells in us, and now he convicts us of our mess. But watch this. The flesh has lost domination over us. We are no longer bound, but we still have an obligation to yield to the Spirit so that we can overcome the flesh. Am I right? Look at 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. So that that's why it's no excuse. That's good. That's why it's no excuse. God says, okay, look, you're tempted. I didn't do this, but you're tempted by your own desires, by your own self. He says, but guess what? There's a door open over there. There's a door over here, and there's another one here. You can get out of here because he makes a way of escape for you. Am I right? That's what it says. Amen? What does it say, sis? No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. He has, given, you, he has given you a door. Go ahead, finish up. That you may be able to endure it. That you may be able to endure. So that means he doesn't put no more on you than you can endure. He doesn't allow it to come upon you. No more than what you can endure. So we say, oh, I couldn't help it. Oh, yes, you can. Because God has opened a door, so, so those things that we're doing, we find ourselves doing, God has given us a way out. But the question, are you taking a way out? That's the question. Any saint who claims total sinless perfection is in a terrible state of self-deception. Sinless perfection, y'all know what that looks like? That means you don't sin. And I think then, I think you get the big head to think you don't sin, but you're really a sinner. 
You really, you've really been saved by the grace of God. You see? Am I right? And you still drag around this. As long as you drag this, there's going to be some, some mess. If you set in your mind and you think some thoughts, it's not the thought don't, that come in your mind is not sin. But it's when you roll it around in your mind and think about, oh my, whoa. You see? Now you've sinned. The Bible says that because you played with it. Am I right? <laughs> Look at 1 John real quick. 1, 8 and 10. 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh -huh. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh -huh. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. He comes back twice. He says it twice. If you say that you've never sinned or you don't sin, even as a Christian, you're a liar. Truth is not in you. So, so, so as a Christian, we don't get the big head. We still, got, we still struggle too, am I right? But we thank God for the blood. Thank God for the grace. Thank God for forgiveness. He says in 1-9, if you says when we confess our sins, he is faithful, he is just to forgive us of what? All of our sins. Because he just wants you to come clean. You know how you got your kid? All right, little Johnny, I want you to come on, man. Did you do that in school? No, sir. I ain't do it. I tell my dad, no, sir. He already know. You go to school, JoJo? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. He said, you did? He, my dad would go like this. You did, did you? And his eyebrows go up, and he'd go like this. And he'd walk up on you slow. He said, you did, huh? <laughs> Floor you. Because he already know, and you knew that, but you want to hold on to the lie. Anybody ever hold on to a lie? You hold on to the lie. I'm holding on to the lie. Hopefully I get away from this. I'm shaking my leg. Man, that joker said, get those switches and come on back up in here. They don't, some of these young folks don't know about no switch or belts and none of that because they'll call social service on you now. Amen? But we, they didn't, wasn't no social service coming to our house. Nah, I'm telling y'all. Am I right? Old school. Am I right, Steve? There wasn't no social service coming to the house. I want you to get this. Sin cannot take away our salvation. But it does tear us down spiritually and emotionally. See, there is consequences in it. And I'm going to show you David's consequences. My God. David had some consequences. And you're like, whoa, God forgave him, but he still had to deal with it. So there are some consequences. So the decisions that we make, we got to be very careful. Am I right? <laughs> So as long as we are occupied these bodies, there will be the capacity for sin. Even David. Look at Acts 13, 22, real quick. 13, 22. It says, and when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king. He removed Saul. And of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. Now, wait a minute, God, now, come on now. But David did all that stuff, but yet he was a man after God's own heart. What does that mean? That means, watch this, that his heart was bent towards God. That his heart was with God, his heart, he loved God, but yet he allowed the flesh to get in the way. See it? He had power, but he allowed the flesh to get in the way. Am I right? Look at, look at the second point real quick. Watch this. The consequences of sin for the believer. Psalms 51 was written by a sinning saint, <laughs> David. David knew full well the consequences, and he begins with a plea for mercy. What does it say in verse 1? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wow. He says, Lord, please. I know that mercy suit my case. I need mercy because I blew it. Hmm. It's something when you don't know where your help come from. See, but he knew. He knew that he had to call on God. He knew he needed the mercies of God. Because understand, if you go back to the Levitical law, he deserved to be stoned. That was adultery. Am I right? He deserved to be stoned. And then he murdered a man. He deserved the execution. Totally. Am I right? Never, never be 
deceived, sin carries a heavy club. We think it don't, but sin carries a heavy club. A sin soils the saint. Look at this real quick. Verse 2, 51-2, Psalms. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So sin will soil you. Am I right? David seeks for cleansing. Sin will make the saint feel dirty. Anybody ever felt that? You sin and you feel dirty? Ain't enough water can wash it off until you go to repent to God because you feel dirty. Am I? Mm. I wish I was back over at the Baptist church. Them guys were, man, what? Huh? The unbeliever and non-Christian will have no difficulty with sin because that's their nature. Because I had that nature too. So we don't, when I was in the world, I didn't have a problem with that. There was a, there was a pig one day in a, in a, in a mar in the mud, just getting dirty, flopping all around, him and his buddy. And, and about, I don't know, a few yards up was a big white house. And they saw the White House, and they looked at the people going in in tuxedos. They were partying, and they said, man, we want to go in that White House one day. Man, they getting it, man. They, I mean, they were getting it, drinking champagne and caviar. And the pig said, I want to go in there one day. Well, the pig cleaned himself up, went and got a tuxedo, got on his hind legs, put a bow tie on, and he saw a stripe. He walking up to the White House. He go in because he's dressed. Clean. He goes in, he eats the herbs, and he's talking to people. He's doing all those things. He's drinking the champagne. But I noticed he kept looking outside. Then he go back in and eat a little bit more, but he kept looking outside. He kept looking back at the pig pen. That was his nature. Am I right? He kept looking back. He kept looking at the pig pen. Finally, he turned, looked at the food, looked at the pig pen. Look at how everybody was clean, but he kept looking at the pig pen. And he started running towards the pig pen, taking off his shirt, taking off his shoes, taking everything off. And he did a swine dive into the pig pen. Why did he do that? Because that was his nature. Huh? See, before you came to Christ, that was your nature. You're in Christ now. There's a conscience, a God conscience. You can't just live any kind of way. You got a new nature. You're a new creature in Christ. Am I right? Huh? The believer will not be able to sin and not be convicted because it's not, it's no longer his nature. See it? It's no longer my nature to do those things. So when I do it, I'm convicted. Amen? I don't know if you know it, that nature has is, is been, is nature really is dead. Y'all hear me? But the only reason that we're still sinning it's because we carry around that old body. We carry around that old habit. You know, some of y'all got habits from when you were young, and some of you 60, 70, 40, 30. And so you're still carrying these habits. Still struggling with the, you say, but you're struggling with the habits because the body said, give it to me now. I want it now. You know what I like. Am I right? Hmm. David's sin was always in his mind. Sin saturates the mind. Look at 51.3. Sin saturates the mind. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Mm -hmm. so, so he understood that, that in his mother's womb that he was sinful. All men are sinful, and they come into the world sinful. So sin saturated his mind. He knew it. David's sin was always in his mind. Amen? Sometimes we can sin in our mind. An unbeliever can sin and forget it. But the Christian will have the sin on his mind until it is dealt with. The Holy Spirit in our heart, watch this, will not allow us to forget it until we repent. Anybody ever been there? I think I'm talking to somebody. You know that, that you can't shake this thing because you haven't repented. And so you're still carrying around the weight of it. The guilt of it. Am I right? Mm. So I said this, I preached a few weeks ago about when you sin and there's no uh, repentance and there's no conscience about it, you got to check your salvation. I can't just do anything without saying, Lord Jesus, 
Oh, forgive me, Lord. That's how I come. Because I realize it. I've blown it. Still saved, but I realize that sometimes I don't cross all the T's and dot all the I's, and you don't either. Am I right? <laughs> so the Holy Ghost in our hearts will not allow us to forget it. Amen? There are two major wounds in the mind. There's guilt and there's sorrow. Sorrow will heal because it's a clean wound. See it? But listen to this. Guilt festers. It infects. The whole life until it is dealt with. Anybody else said, so you ever heard the expression, guilt, that guilt is killing you, isn't it? You look at somebody and say, that guilt is killing you, isn't it? But it's going to kill you until you deal with it. I preached a message about sitting on somebody's couch a few weeks ago, and I said, until you sit down on somebody's couch and get help, and this is for everybody, it's, you, you can't function. You can't function and be effective. You might get over, but you can't do it effectively. Because you got stuff that you didn't deal with. Am I? Mm, 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 mm. Maybe I don't know who I'm talking to. Huh? Somebody said me. <laughs> uh, so David had a deep guilt. David had some stuff in his past that he didn't deal with. And so David had to come clean because he knew he was dirty. Anybody dirty? Just feel like you're dirty? Amen? Guilt manifests itself in temper, lack of concentration, Irritability, uh, uh, irritable, um, no prayer life, lack of appetite, spiritual thing. Any, you want to get in the bed because you, you messed up. See, well, if, you're not, if you're a believer and you ain't convicted, you better, you better check yourself. Am I a believer? Am I really a believer? Because hey, I'm not bothered. I can do anything. It don't bother me. You ever hear people say, it's my life. Mind your business. I can do what I want to do. Amen? Hmm. Look at Psalms real quick. Uh, 34.4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. So he said, I came clean. I wanted to talk to God. I sought him. He delivered me from everything because guess what? You came clean. You got to come clean. We got to surrender. We got to come clean to God, and God can do a work on us. Amen. You know, young people look at me strange. They look at me like, what is he talking about? Pastor's always saying something. Keep living. Keep living. And this is a fact. You keep living, you're going to experience life. And life ain't no joke. Keep living. When my dad said, boy, you're going to see, you're going to have to pay bills. I get it. I'm paying bills now. I get it. Boy, you see, you're going to have to go. I get it. And so the same way with our walk, you keep living, you're going to see this Christian walk, and you're going to need God in your life one day. I promise you. Because things are not going to always be in your favor. Am I right? Sin stings the conscience. Sin will sting your conscience. Look at 51.4 real quick. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. I like what he says. He says, against you and you only uh, have I. The opposite word is I. I sinned and done what was evil in your sight, so that you may be justified. So he says, I. And then he says, behold, I. At the next verse, I. Everything's I. He understands. He's not like Adam and Eve playing the blame game. He's taking the heat. I'm wrong, Lord. I know, what, I know what Adam and Eve did, but I'm not coming like that. I want to come clean. He was broken. Broken. Humility. Something, isn't it? Humility. David knew his sins deserved discipline. It deserved the judgments of God. David hurt a lot of people in his fall, but ultimately his evil was against God, a holy God. Amen. You know, when you sin, it's against that person. Yes, I'm sure. But ultimately, it's against God. It's against God. And it's against the principles of God. Are y'all with me? Hmm. How y'all doing? Y'all holding up? Got the seatbelt on? Amen. He said, keep preaching. You better know when to call on God's mercy. You better know when to call on God for mercy. Sometimes we don't know when. And we call people, and we call different things, and we, we look up different stuff on. We Google stuff. We like, let me see what I got to do with this. No, man. You got to know where your help come from. 
You got to know where the mercy and the grace comes from. Am I right? Huh? David was broken because he had hurt God. He was unable to wash himself to escape the guilt of his wickedness. He was unable to cleanse himself. I don't care what he did. I don't care if he went for a long horse ride. I don't care what he did. He couldn't shake it. And then God says, now you're at the end of yourself. Let me send Nathaniel, Nathan, to really show you yourself. <laughs> Isn't that something? God knows how to show us ourselves. And do you, do you see how quick David was so judgmental? Kill the man. I'm going to get him. Oh, you, let, let me see him. He says, you the man. See, that same stuff come back. Be careful how judgmental we are. We ain't got it all together. Pastor ain't got it all together. You ain't got it all together. Thank God for God's grace. Thank him for his grace. Amen? Come on. Hmm. A true Christian weeps not over the consequences of his actions, but he weeps really because he has offended and disgraced a heavenly father. Amen? When we sin, we are attacking the father's right to be God in our life. He's still God, but we're attacking that right. We're really saying, you're not my God. I'm my own man. I got this. And you put your chest out. You beat on your chest. But really, he's your God. And he'll get you where you need to be. Amen? Sin saddens the heart. Look at, look at, look at 51, 8, and then go down to 12. 51, 8, and then go down to 12. Sin saddens the heart. Mm. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Mm. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. We're going down to 12. You went down to 12? Yeah. Mm. You quick with it. I couldn't even get no water. So let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Watch this. David lost his joy. See, I don't know if you know it. When you find yourself in a mess, you don't have no joy. You may have the pseudo joy. You may have that joy. That's a false joy. And you run around smiling and all that, but really the joy is going. Am I right? Huh. David wanted his joy back. If you are saved, sin will make you the most miserable person on earth. When you're in a mess, because you lose your joy. You can front it, you can cloak it, you can put up a face, but really you've lost your joy. Am I right? I don't just sit down with this word, I put a lot of thought in it. I pray about it, and I want God to show me. And as he was showing me some stuff, I called one of my boys and bounced it off of him. I was excited because I saw how God works. That he loves me, that he graces me, even in that, but yet. He wants me to come clean. Am I? Mm. Mm. So David's heart was saddened. Amen? It was saddened. So if you're saved, you, you, it will make you miserable. You cannot live in a backslidden condition and expect to have happiness. Joy is the byproduct of a right relationship with God. So when you got that joy, that shows you that you got the joy of the Lord. Amen? You got God's joy. Why? Because you're a child of God. Amen? Have you lost your joy today? Somebody in here lost their joy. You can, watch this, you can tell a backslider by his or her lack of joy. I'm not talking about a pseudo joy again. I'm talking about real joy. He said, man, he ain't himself today or she ain't herself today because there's no joy. There's no joy. It's something to have the joy of God in your life. No matter what's happening in your life, but there's a joy in God. There's a peace in God to know that he's going to work it all out. Am I right? Hmm. It's something when you take on that situation by yourself and you try to fix it yourself, isn't it? And you try to fix it, but the more you try to fix it, the worse it gets. The worse it gets, you're trying to fix it again, and the worse it gets. Sometimes we get, we, listen, sometimes we date, we get the same type of dude. Same type of person. Sometimes you got it, and you got the same dude over and over and over again. Why? Because we're trying to fix it. Let God fix it. Sometimes we got to be still and just say, God, work on me. 
work on me. I need you now to work on me, not everybody else. Because, see, you ain't worked on you, but you got relationships, and they ain't worked on them. Oh, you got a mess on your hands. Hmm. So then there's no joy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Huh? True abiding joy is not affected by circumstance or difficulty. It is, however, affected by sin. True joy will all, I mean, sin will always affect true joy. Am I right? If true joy is missing in your life, it is because something has gotten between you and God. I, I, look, at, I look at Facebook. I get on and off. I'll be on for two years, a year, I mean, I mean months. Then I'll get off. But I notice that there's a lot of pseudo joy, a lot of false joy. It's nothing like having the joy of God. We talk about, we ain't talking about little G. We talk about big G. We talk about the God that set the stars in the sky, the God that made the galaxies, the God that made the first, second, and third heaven, the God that put this very earth that we live on on an axle and began to move it. We talk about that God. We serve him. He gives a joy. Am I? Mm. Sin sickens the body. Sin will make you sick. Am I? <laughs> Sin will make you sick. Look at verse 8, sis. Sin will make you sick. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Mm. See, David, sin will sicken you. David's sin has begun to take a physical toll on his life. Amen? Sin will always take a toll on you. Amen? Sin and worry can get down to the core of your bones. Sin does this. It will make you sick. Mm. Right? It can damage your health and your mind. You know that? Paul's warning to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, watch this. I want to tell you, they were taking the Lord's Supper and doing it any kind of way. They were doing God any kind of way. It wasn't sacred. It wasn't nothing. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 20. Um, is, uh, 29, sorry, sis. 11, 29 is Four. to 30. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So they were sick. They were in the church sick because they weren't doing what God told them to do, and they wasn't looking at the communion table as being sacred. They were doing their own thing, running to the table, eating everything up. And they got sick. He says, and some even died. Some even died. And they were supposed to be believers. These are believers. I believe God has snatched your tail up out of here if you ain't doing right. I believe that. And it's only the grace of God that we're here. Somebody must do some real stuff now. <laughs> they must do some Ananias and Sapphira stuff. You're like, hey, God, damn, they're gonna be gone. You know, God took your drug out. Huh? <laughs> Am I right? Huh? So it can damage your health. Sin can replace joy and peace with worry and fear. It has an impact on our ability to be well. God, watch this, God never casts us off when we sin. He'll, he'll put you somewhere where you don't want to be, but he doesn't cast you off. Because, listen, you're still, watch this, saved, but you're not in fellowship. You know, when the wife or husband get on your nerves, you know, you're still married, but yet you're like, I ain't talking to you. Right? 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 Look at, look at, look at, Dick laughing. But am I right? Because, look, a, a daughter and, and, and a daddy or whatever, you know, hey, if they, if they ain't right, don't talk to me until you get this thing right. Don't you say one word to me. And my dad would tell me, get your lion tail back in the room. And he shut me down. He shut me down. That joke was, man, he, he passed, but that joke was hard as nails. If I hope I this short, man, you like a drill saw. And that joke will put it to you. Now, y'all laughing, man. Y'all don't know I had it rough up in that joke, man. But he came back to me. He said, son, I want to tell you I'm proud of you, man. Out of all my children, I never thought you would amount to nothing. 
And that was hard, but yes, but guess what? That was my motivation. Huh? To move forward. That was it. But I thank God. I told him one day, I said, I thank God for your discipline. I thank God that you didn't leave me out here by myself. I thank God that when I didn't do right, my report card was bad, or when I went out and did something and it came back to you, that you whipped my tail. I'm glad. Because guess what? I'm a better person. Right, Dina? I'm a better person. I tell you what my mama said. She said, uh, where you going? Mom, I'm going up the street. I'm like, you ain't going nowhere. I'm saying, why not? Yeah, I'm getting older now. I'm like, why not? I'm ready to buck, but I got a daddy got to come back home. I'm ready. Because mom was a small woman. I'm like, I'm going outside. What's up? Don't let me tell your daddy. I mean, immediately, because you just feed that juggle was just, what? Man, that juggle is split. You know, <laughs> That's my cousin, Ray. Jadina's my cousin. She knows. She's laughing. She's like, man, Mr. Joe, cousin Joe. Wasn't no joke, was it? But you here. So, so I'm saying it to say this. He didn't do it because he disliked me. He did it because he loved me. And God does it because he loves us. Those that are loved are chastened. I love you, and I want to see you right. He said, David, I called you. I anointed you. I want to see you in step with me. You need to repent now. And get this thing right, and David did. Amen? I got a hustle, don't I? 1230. I got a hustle. I'm got me sweating up in this thing. My wife said, you're going to sweat in that turtleneck? We don't listen. Men don't listen. Why are you wearing a turtleneck with a jersey? <laughs> my wife, my wife's a mess, boy, I tell you. That joke is a mess. And then I got to tell her she's right later. God dang it, I'm burning up like a mug. Uh, right, baby? Uh, my girl, man. Let me see something here. Where we at? Y'all that messed me up. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh. Woo! Take your time. Amen. I want you to see this. God never casts us off when we sin. I said it before. But he just squeezes us closer to himself until we get it right. God used the prophet Nathan to convict David. But I got, we got to look at that story. I know it's a lot, but I got to look at this story, guys. I know y'all don't mind. We got time for the game. What time the game coming on? 3 o'clock. We're going to see the game at 3 o'clock. Let's go, uh, sis, uh, 2 Samuel 12, 1. Just keep reading. I want y'all to see this thing. Is that all right? And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. Uh -huh. The rich man had very many flock and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ill lamb, which he had brought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used, it, was, excuse me, it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and uh -huh. lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of this hand of Saul. What verse are you in? Eight. Eight. Now I want you to get this. Hold on, guys. He says, he said, listen here, God said, look here, boy, I gave you your master's house, because this is Saul now, I gave you his house, I gave you his wives, I don't know if they, don't know if they were old, I don't know, <laughs> because Saul was older, but uh, as, I, as I did my study, some say that they were servants, he made them servants, some say that it could have been his women, you know, so uh, <laughs> real quick, he says, the wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel. End of Judah. And if this was not enough, if this was not enough, I would have gave you more. But you have done this thing to me. See it? 
So when, so when he did it, he did it against God. It was personal. God said, this is personal. You are the God. You listen, he said, you are the guy that I put in front to lead Israel. And you didn't set an example. But watch what he does. What verse? Nine? Yeah. Uh, nine, nine says, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah, the Hittite, with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never, this is the consequences, shall never depart from your house because you have despised me, have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So, so understand, God forgave, but yet there was consequences in what we do. Am I right? Look at number 11. It says, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. Talking about Absalom, right? He says, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Goodness. And there's a lot more in that. I just, I mean, when I looked at this, I said, we got to be very careful. God forgives, but yet he allowed us to go through the consequences of life. We made, look, some people went out and did their thing and had babies and all that. Well, you're still dealing with the consequences of it. For the next, I don't know how to you die. Am I right? Huh. What verse? I got to look at a little bit more of this. What uh -huh. verse? 13. 13. Read it, sis. David <clears throat> said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. So see, 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 see. So, so what, what God does is allow you to see the consequences, but yet he comes back to let you know, I've forgiven you. You're going to be all right. See it? But you're going to still have to deal with the consequences. Anybody ever did, did some stuff and you just got to still deal with the consequences? I had a, I had a baby when I was... Um, 18, I was in the military. And um, he also, ooh, I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know Jesus. I was doing my thing, you know. So, the sister said, hey, you going to the military? I said, yeah. She said, how are you going to go in the military? My sister's pregnant. I said, what? I'm, I'm signed up. I'm ready to roll. I said, in the military? She said, in the military? I said, yeah, I'm good. She said, my sister's pregnant. I said, what? Pregnant? She didn't tell me. She didn't want to ruin what, what, what God was doing. You see my point? I mean, what, he didn't, didn't want to ruin my plan. So anyway, I ended, up, I ended up going in the military. I got out a few years later. First person I went to see when I got back was my daughter. They said she's in a daycare over there. And I went in the daycare. All these kids in there, but I recognized them. Never seen a picture. Never seen a picture. You see my point? So I'm saying this to say that. I mean, that's my baby there. That's, man, that's the oldest. That's the, she's the creme de la creme. I don't get, don't get jealous now. But she's the creme, she's the creme de la creme. That's my baby. We call, she called me, Dad, what's up? We talked, man, for two hours, three hours. She said, who are you talking to? I talking to the teacher. It's my baby girl. You see? But I want to say all that to say this. Hey, I'm transparent. I'm not trying to hide anything. I want to be honest with you. But I want to say this to say that. I'm still dealing with the consequences of it. She, she's not a burden or anything. But I'm saying it is consequences in the things we do before Christ and while we're in Christ. Am I right? There is always going to be consequences. I had a, one day she called me and said, Dad. She said, I think I may have told this story. She said, Dad. Um, she married a guy I didn't want to marry. She said, Dad. Uh, um, he's in Delaware. I said, I said oh, what's up? She said, I want to get some money. I said, well, let me speak to him. He said, she said, Dad, he don't want to talk. I said, he don't want what? I gave her to you, and now she's your response. Merle in the Delaware, I'll be right back. <laughs> no, this is the truth. I tell, I tell you the story all the time. I run all the way to Delaware. I never forget it. And I said, man, when I gave her to you, she is your responsibility. So if you need anything or y'all need anything, you call me. See, we, we don't have men like that anymore. We need men to make a move like that because when you make moves like that and let that dude know you can't do this. I talked to a friend the other day. He told me, he says, uh, yeah, I told my daughter, don't be bringing no guys to me after you meet them. It made sense what he said. You meet them. He says, I want you to bring them to me as soon as you meet them. 
not three months later, six months later. I want him to know that there's a standard here. I'm your dad. I'm standing here. If he do something wrong, I got your back. Am I right? So God, God is that father. He loves us. You see how I'm bringing it back? God is that father. He loves us that much that he has our back. Amen? I'll get out there for a minute with the John. John looked like, okay. <laughs> ah, okay, let's look at this real quick, y'all. Uh, sin seals the lips. We, we almost done. Sin will seal the lips. Watch this, 51, 13 through 15. Psalms. 13 through 15. Then I will, I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood gut. Guilt. Excuse me, blood Guilty. guiltiness, O oh God, O oh God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. See, I want you to get what he said here. He says, then I will teach transgressors your way, but I need you to restore me first. I need you to get me right first. But here it is. All the things David says he will do when he gets right with God. See, he realized I can't do this stuff if I'm not right with you. Are y'all with me? It's some things that you're trying to do, you can't do, because you're not in step with God, and you never got it right. And so you're trying to do stuff, and stack, and do all this stuff, and stuff keep falling. Because you never got it right. Sin will take away your shout, take away your song, take away your impact. You can shout, but there's no presence of God. You can sing, but there's no joy. You can impact, think you're impacting, and there's no results. See, he hasn't left your life, but yet he's like this. He's like that father with a son that's been disobedient. He's like this. Come on, son. Get it right. I want to use you. Come on, son. Come on, son. And God is waiting for us to get it right. Am I right? All the while, Satan is doing this. Guess what he's doing? He's pointing at you laughing and accusing you, trying to keep you down, trying to keep you in that same place, and you keep regurgitating it like a cow. He keeps spitting that stuff up and chewing the cud, and he puts it back down, and he brings it back up, and that's what the devil does. He keeps bringing this stuff up, and we have never dealt with it, so we take it every time. Am I right? Mm. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you are right there today, not where you used to be with the Lord. Not where you know you ought to be. Not where you could be. You are in a backsliding state. But we thank God that he's able to bring you out. He's able to bring you out. All heads are bowed just for a minute. Just for a minute. If you're in your seat and you know that this is you, partially you, and you're not what you ought to be, and you're struggling, I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to give you what you need that you can be empowered that you can yield to the Spirit of God, that you can come with a heart of repentance, and that you can get in step with God so that you can move forward and be effective for God. If you're here today, and that's you, and you know that I, I'm, I'm in Christ, I know it, but I want to come up, I want prayer because I want to be effective for God. I'm not where I need to be with him. I'm saved, but not where I need to be. Come on up. I want to pray with you. Amen. I want to pray with you. Amen. God has called some of us for different things, and we have not answered the call. The call. We have not done what God has called us to do, and this is it. Amen. 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 Come on up. Amen. Come on up. If you're not where you should be in Christ, and you know it, and you know that you need God to do a work in your life. Come on up. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. If 
Father God, we come now thanking you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for looking beyond our faults and seeing our need. But Lord, some of our faults have gotten in the way. We have gotten in our own way. We have got prideful and different things in our life, Lord, that you want to do, but we are holding back. We have not forgiven some people, Lord, Father God, some transgressions. Lord, we know that it's affecting us. We can't move forward. Help us, even now, to be like David. He realized, Lord, and he asked, Lord, that you would have mercy. Have mercy on us. Even now, speak to our hearts. Even now, Lord, reach every heart now in front of this church at the altar. Reach their hearts, Lord, that they could see you high and lifted up. And, Lord, they can be in tune with your spirit. You say go left, that they would go left. But, Lord, that they would deal with the issues of life, Lord, Father God, that may be holding them back from going left or right. So, Lord, give them what they need. Give them the strength that they need, that they may be able to move forward, Father God, to be productive for the kingdom of God. Because, Lord, we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time. And it's all about whose life are we impacting? How are we impacting lives? How is a life changed because we're in their life? But if anything is hindering that, anything, we pray, Lord, that we would deal with it accordingly, that we would give it to you, that we would surrender it today and say, Lord, please take it. Forgive me for playing my part in it, whatever it might be. Forgive me for getting in my own way. Forgive me for not listening to you. Forgive me for not listening to the call that you have on my life. Forgive me for not answering the call. God knows. You know, Lord, from the pulpit to the door. Lord, we want you to say, well done. We want you to say you did a great job. So, Lord, please move on the hearts of your people today that they would see you high and lifted up. Lord, that they would surrender right now. Touch their heart. Take their stony hearts and turn them to a heart of flesh. Take them and penetrate hearts. Even those that might hear it on Facebook or wherever it might be, I pray even now, Lord, that you would draw a soul to yourself, that they would cry out and say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Because realizing, Lord, that we don't have a lot of time. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. We thank you for this church. I thank you for this family, Father God, this extended family, Lord. This is my family. We're family, Lord, and we thank you for what you have done. Even our finance, you've blessed us. Even our spiritual walk, you've blessed us. And, Lord, we're coming to you fasting this week, asking that you help us with different issues in life. We need you. We can do nothing without you. Have your way, Father God. And bless that soul, Lord, Father God, that's wayward, that soul, Lord, that's indecisive, that's harping between two opinions. I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that they would have a heart of forgiveness, that they would cry and say, Lord, please forgive me, and they would surrender to you. So we thank you, Lord. We pray for your presence. You continue to move in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Come on up, Ms. McKinney. Maybe there's a soul here, too, that may not know the Lord. I, wanna, I don't want to leave you hanging. If there's someone here that may not know Christ, um, today is the day of salvation. I could talk or I could say all this stuff, but yet if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it means nothing to you. So I want to see if anyone may not have, that may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ would surrender their life today. If there's no one here, I'm going to get out your way. Amen? Amen. If you want to talk to me after service, you can, about salvation. Amen? Amen. Amen.